Live from ClickOrlando.com, this is News 6 at 5.30. This is a News 6 Plus takeover. Here now is Solutionaries. Hey, welcome back to Solutionaries. I'm Lewis Bolden. Solutionaries is a show where we highlight the challenges in our community and those working to fix them. Today we're focusing on our kids and the risks they face on the web. Online predators, they are after our kids. There are half a million active online predators every single day using phones, computers and games to tap into our networks. They're preying on our kids' insecurities and getting them to do things like send nude pictures. We know the people that are trying to fix this and the program that's working. We'll get to that in a second, but first, a story of one family's experience. A warning, this is hard to hear. So at the hospital, the doctor said it was one of the most brutal rates she had seen on an adult, let alone a child. The day that changed Amanda Staub's life forever. It all started when her mom got a computer for work. Amanda was just 13 years old. And I never once thought anything would happen because of a computer. Never dreamed that predators were even out there 22 years ago. Somebody had posed as a 13 year old and they hacked into that chat room and acted as one of the friends of a student and was just getting information. I always thought he was a 14 year old male and it ended up being a 36 year old adult. They chatted online for months. You gave him little details and then yes. he stalked you for a couple weeks. To yes. Talk to me about that. So because he knew I cheered and played soccer, he had taken the school colors that I had given him because he kind of knew the vicinity of the location that I was in and looked up and found my middle school that I was at. Then he was able to go on the website because as every school does, we post our schedules on there and was able to find out practices, games. So he was able to map out my whole path. And once he knew that, he followed my bus home. He was able to map out the location of our neighborhood and things like that. To the point where the neighborhood watch even reported a mysterious vehicle that wasn't seen a lot. He definitely had a whole plan. He knew when my parents would leave for work. He knew when my older sister would go to school. He knew when I would leave and come back. But before she knew all of this, the middle schooler says she got a babysitting job in the neighborhood. And that's the day everything changed and I went walking up to the house I was supposed to babysit at. And during that walk, a truck pulled up and literally no sooner than he said my name, Amanda, and I turned, I was in the truck and taken. Taken by 36-year-old Donald Lee Williams Jr. Vicki Johnson realized something was wrong when she hadn't heard from her daughter. She was gone for over five and a half hours when the state police were just combing the areas. He brought her here to this hotel just six minutes away from her house. He held her here for hours where she was brutally raped and assaulted. I remember that evening the police coming to my house and asking me for something that belonged to Amanda, something that had her scent on it. And I remember looking at them thinking they think she's dead. Williams eventually brought her back and that's when state police arrested him. She was rushed to the hospital when the doctor came out and she specifically said to us, this is one of the most brutal rapes and beatings we've ever witnessed on a child. And uh, I was told that it would take a long time to recover and that I could probably never have kids one day. He was chatting with about 60 kids online when they confiscated his computer. And so he, he had them lined up. The uh, little girl from Williamsburg, he had already raped three times. But he told each one of these girls the same thing. If you tell, I'm gonna kill your mom and I'm gonna kill you. And neither one of them said a word. So I hate with a passion that this happened to my daughter, but it's what finally stopped him. But that only stopped him for so long. He served his 14 years. And in 2013, he was released from prison. He had 10 years of probation and a little under seven years, he tried to take another child. And at this time, he tried to take an ICAC officer. So he was arrested immediately. And he has been recharged with the suspended sentence that he got on Amanda's case and the Williamsburg case. And so I was told that he'd be in prison for the rest of his life. 
What happened here in this neighborhood in Winchester is something Amanda wants to happen to no one else. So that's why she's teamed up with organizations to educate kids and parents about Internet safety. I'm Eddie Worth. I'm president of Safe Surfing Foundation. Kids weren't really listening to what adults had to say. It took us quite a while to, to understand that. But once we, we realized, we decided that let's try to do a peer-to-peer -peer program. This is not for some old gray-haired guy to come in and talk about. It's not for SRO or teach. This is for kids to teach, teach kids. Eddie Worth is the Safe Surfing Foundation president. He's traveled with Vicki and Amanda, who are now national spokeswomen for the organization spreading awareness. Whether it be Snapchat, Twitter, Facebook. The peer-to-peer -peer program is, is a proven program to work, whether it be adults, children, whatever. Kids listen to kids, adults listen to adults. So we contracted with the National White Collar Crime Center to develop a program that we could teach kids to educate kids. We would give school resource officers the lesson plans, have them facilitate a club, which is Cyber SWAT, and the SWAT stands for Safety While Accessing Technology. The kids would put the programs together and talk to the kids. And there are predators, there's evil in the world, and they know how to use these devices just as good as our students do. Because they can see where you're at. Yeah. See where you're yeah. at. School resource officer Sergeant Gregory Quisenberry works in Floyd County High School running the Cyber SWAT Club. It scares me to death. It scares me that some of the stuff that I've seen the kids do, it's, it's just, it's, it's horrifying that there's people out here that take advantage of, of innocent kids. He's worked multiple cases, flagged when the school system software sees something on a computer or phone. They have like filters for inappropriate pictures and stuff like that. You're talking about teenagers with nude pictures? Exactly. And, you know, most of it was just between boyfriend and girlfriend, but still yet they didn't understand the fact that once that picture was sent, if they broke up one day, that picture could be sent out anywhere in the world. For me, I think we need to like bring realization that this is real yeah. and like kids need to realize that this isn't something that you need to play with. Like it's something that's serious and you can take a step back because it's not going to hurt anything if you take a step back. McKinley Leonard and Micah Underwood are 10th graders, handpicked to start the Cyber SWAT program that will grow every year. Because each one of y'all ha have kids that's in probably an elementary school that know who you are, right? So when you walk in, you're going to be like famous to them. Hey, he's high schooler. So when you speak, they're going to listen, and that's the whole goal. Kids will learn from kids more than they can from adults, for sure. Are there limitations to this working here in Floyd County or beyond? Um, I guess the limitations is just all based into the, the students that are involved. I mean, we, we tried to handpick students that we knew were capable and had the desire to be involved, um, were kind of had a leadership mind. Quessenberry says it's like a secret life for some of these kids online. The, this one person that's shy, doesn't like to talk to people, can completely be vocal and outspoken on a social media outlet because they're not face to face with them. And that's the problem that we're having. Safe Surfing says there are red flags and warning signs that your child is being groomed. If you see any of these while you're looking through your kids' messages, ask more questions. Praise or flattery, they play into children having self-esteem issues. Photo sharing. Privacy, if your child's being asked to keep a conversation secret. Presence, sending gifts even electronically, so monitor their email. Watch for packages in the mail or extra Robux or V-Bucks on their gaming platforms. Pulling away. The person will tell your child they should be making more time for them. Look for signs in the conversation that the predator is possessive. If you can't reach out your hand and physically touch and address that person, you can't be sure who that person is behind the screen. We can create any type of identity we want to be, any type of vision we have, and there are some people out there that don't come out there with the best intentions. And I care, I care about these kids. We all do. We want to educate them because we're not going to lock up all the predators. It's just not going to happen. And we can't get to enough people fast enough. And, and that's our one desire. We want people to take it serious. We want them to know that predators are out there. They are looking for these kids. 
Safe Surfing is always adding to the list of things that can be taught through the Cyber SWAT program. Right now, they're adding human trafficking, and schools can pick what they want to teach based on what's needed at that time. Here's the cool thing. The results show this is working. Kids are listening and paying attention. They piloted this in 2019 before COVID hit in 10 different schools across the country, rural, urban, private, and all the kids said they are listening. Now, parents, we know this is some scary stuff. On our website, clickorlando.com, we've listed some resources that may be able to help you, including a free ebook to show you how to set up security settings on your kids' devices and some free apps to help you monitor what your kids are doing online. Coming up on Solutionaries, we're taking a look at what's being done to fill the gender gap in policing. I mean, they'll straight up tell you that it's a male-dominant career, but you just got to go in and prove yourself. Is that important? Yes, proving yourself is very important. Welcome back, I'm Lewis Bolden. This is Solutionaries, a show where we highlight the challenges in our community and those working to fix them. One of those challenges is representation in our police force. You've likely noticed there are a lot of men on the force, but not a lot of women. You know, the chances are that when you call police for help, the officers who arrive at your house are going to be men. We are here. We do exist. Um... Women make up half the country's population, but take a look at this. They make up only 12 percent of law enforcement. So why aren't there more female cops? Well, we took that question here to a local sheriff to get his take. We also talked to some recruiters to see if they're shaking things up a little bit. All right, ready? Ready! ready. But we started a local police academy to see if more women are actually signing up. Five, six. Believe it or not, <laughs> Brianna Dion Go. and Jayshali Berrios signed up to take these guys down. Ever since I was a little kid, I always aspired to be a police officer. It wasn't a plan. It wasn't a plan. They're going through some really rigorous physical training to be cops at Valencia College's Criminal Justice Institute in Orlando. And there's only three women in this class of 46. I mean, they'll straight up tell you that it's a male dominant career, but you just got to go in and prove yourself. Is that important? Yes, proving yourself is very important. You, you got to show them that you're just as good as they are. I mean, that's pretty much what it is. Do you feel that you have to prove something? Not at all. Really? Not at all. Um, it may seem like it. I walk in every day like every other recruit. I don't see sex, I don't see color, I don't see anything. I just walked in, I do the best I can uh, uh, within you know, the best of my abilities, um, and that's pretty much it. I just want to prove my, to myself. If I have something to prove, that will be to myself, not to anyone else. We're going to show you how police agencies are working to get more women in this class. All right, so we just finished covering fake rec, right? where women um, are teaching, too. That's Winter Park Police office. Detective Caitlin Gonzalez. The person is intoxicated and falling all over the place in the middle of the road, and you see cars swerving all over the place to avoid them. Criminal or not criminal? It's not criminal, but can you just go, eh, that stinks. No. Hope he's okay. No, no right? That's, that's my academy class. Um, there's me right there. John Mina is the sheriff in Orange County, Florida. Uh, so here's the females. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, six out of like 23. And... But he says he wants that number to go up even higher, and he thinks he may have found part of the solution. His agency is one of nearly 250 across the country that have signed on to something called the 30 by 30 initiative. It was created by police leaders and researchers at NYU Law School's policing project. When they sign on, police chiefs and sheriffs pledge to increase the number of women in their ranks to 30 percent by the year 2030. Orange County's already halfway there, with women making up 15 percent of their deputies. Do you think it's a good solution? I think it is a good solution. I think it's, I think we could do more. You know, we have to start somewhere. Denise Demps has been a sheriff's deputy for more than 30 years. Chief Deputy Denise Demps. She was promoted to chief deputy in 2021, which made her the highest ranking female in Orange County. Now, when we started with the agency, of course, 
all you saw was males. So it was a little intimidating, but I knew that if I could get any, if I can get through the military training, I can do anything. And she's inspiring other women too. I walked out the front office, out of the uh, front of the sheriff's office yesterday, going to my car to put something in the car, mm -hmm. and there was three young ladies walking up to the to the door, and you could tell they were coming for just regular business. And I said, okay, who's joining today? And one of them said, oh, I'll join. And I said, okay, come on, let's go. And they're like, well, uh, oh, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> she said, okay, I, I'm, I'm here to do this business, but I, I'm, I'm going to come around to HR. So I, I'm going to check and see if she did show up. The more women see us out here, the more it looks possible. Today, we're trying to recruit for the Orange County Sheriff's Office. Deputy Cindy Zayas is part of the solution on the front line. She is actively recruiting for Orange County. We really, it, we would love to have you. Um, so we are we also are offering our Academy sponsorship. And as we watched, it didn't take her long to find a young woman interested in joining at the career fair. We really, really, really shine when it comes to our ability to de-escalate and to empathize in our reports and understanding victims and what they're going through. We're amazing at that. We're literally rock stars at it, okay? We Oh, thanks. Let's talk a little bit about why you decided to get into law enforcement. You know, was was that something that you felt passionate about at a young age, or is it just something that came about? Kyle Sharman. Kyra Simmons. Terrell Sturdivant. Kyra Simmons is a former university track and field athlete, and she says she chose to join law enforcement during the pandemic. You don't really see a lot of people like me doing this job, and... What do you mean like you? Black females. I went ahead and applied. I actually didn't tell my dad until the last minute that I was doing this. And he definitely had his reservations as far as like, absolutely not. Like, Really? My dad told me so many times, you could just come back home. We'll figure it out. You can work at my job doing something in like security. And I'm like, we can't work together, dad. <laughs> we can't do that. I've been a solo deputy for about a year and a half now. What do you think now? About? Being a deputy. Oh, I love it. I love it. It's it's always something different. Um, so every day when I come to work, I can't expect the day that I had before. Um, the people that I meet, the stories that I learn from them, um, it just it just makes you realize that this is a humanized job. Like a lot of people like to think like when I put on this uniform that like I'm not like them or like I can't relate to them. But like just seeing the different things that people have gone through and experienced. Um, it's definitely made me, I feel like, more of a, a human, in a way, if that makes sense. Okay. Because sometimes when we put this on, like, we, we tend to forget that, like, we're just like them at the end of the day. We know we're not where we are supposed to be. But the sheriff and other police leaders say they see solutions in a national campaign at hiring more female officers. Normally, we are the calming factor in a situation because we're less aggressive. But departments need to actively recruit. So you're going to have all the training in the world. You're going to have your jiu-jitsu and aikido training. So you'll be, you're going to be like, wow, you know. <laughs> to get more women in the police academy Eight. to ultimately serve and protect. If you are committed to the community, committed to helping people, this is the career for you. If you're interested in exploring a career in law enforcement, we have more information for you on ClickOrlando.com. And while you're there, make sure to check out what solutionaries are doing when it comes to making sure kids are getting a good education. Kids being tardy to school, if it's excessive, you want to find out why. Um, you're investigating early pickups. If kids are leaving school early, you want to find out why. And of course, when kids are not in school on a regular basis. And what you can do to get a good night's rest. It's uh, a little after four in the afternoon. My day starts around 3.30 in the morning when I get up. And so all I wanna do is just get into cozy clothes. It's a little bit before 7 p.m. So the tricky thing is, Trying to get enough sleep before then. It's already a little bit after eight in the evening and I'm hoping my mind doesn't go race in different directions as I lay my head down on my pillow, but we'll see how it goes. All right, I got about five hours of inconsistent sleep and I'm already hearing that 
It's gonna be a busy morning. So many more topics are available for you to explore. To learn more, just download the new Six Plus app. Scroll down to Solutionaries and start watching.